Good morning. If you will, take your Bibles and open them up with me uh, to the Gospel of Mark. We're in Mark chapter 12. We're continuing on what we started yesterday, where Jesus entered Jerusalem as the king, as the prophet, as the priest. And in a moment, it seems as though the greatness is being fulfilled and that God's plan will be coming to fruition, but we're, we're seeing it fall apart. We see Jesus come into the temple and he does a divine inspection of what's going on in the temple and reveals that the temple is like the fig tree that Jesus has cursed. It has all the outward advertisement. Come here, the fig tree is saying, and you'll find fruit. But then when Jesus looked, there was no fruit. The temple is saying, hey, come to the temple and get to know Yahweh. But when anybody from any part of the world would come there, there was no place for them to get to know Yahweh. All it was was a place for them to be used. A place for them to see other people who loved money. And so we get into chapter 12. And I want you to keep that in mind. Jesus sees them as false. They're telling people that they're going to help them get to know God, but they're not helping people get to know God. So as we get into uh, chapter 12, we're going to see this narrative extended more. And it's building. They're, so, they're getting more and more and more upset. As we finish chapter 11, remember, they were saying, hey, but why? by what authority do you do this? And they knew full well the authority that he professed. But he traps them. And, and, and they're so upset that they have to say these words, we do not know. but we're going to make him pay. So if you haven't already read chapter 12, read it. And then we're going to pray and we're going to dive in. Father God, we love you. We thank you for this day that you have given to us to serve you, to know you, and Father, to know your word. May this not be just an exercise we do to get knowledge, but Father, there are people that we're going to come in contact with today that don't know you. And so, Father, keep it at the forefront of our minds that you have called us to be your ambassadors. You have called us to be your mouthpiece. So, Father, as we look into your word, may your words be in our heart and on our tongues, and may we be ready, willing, and able to share your love with others today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus begins chapter 12 with a parable. Um, remember, a parable is supposed to come alongside, give a, a story that we can understand from physical things that will help Jesus explain spiritual things. But more often than not, the parable begins with this really pretty picture. And as long as that's all we get is the picture, it just remains a real pretty picture. But when Jesus starts to explain the parable, then that picture turns into a mirror showing us our rot and decay and separation from God. And that generally is where people get mad at Jesus. It's fine for him to give parables. It, what, what they don't want is when he starts applying it to their lives. I had a man one time early on in ministry says, uh, I think you really explained the Bible well. He said, where you get into trouble is when you start applying it. Well, all biblical teaching doesn't seem to have any, we don't have any problem with it until you start saying, hey, this is a problem for me. And Jesus went there. Does God want us to go there in our own lives? Totally. So please don't just read this as 
a problem that Israel had that we don't have. So he gives this parable initially. He says, a man planted a vineyard. Okay, so why, first, why does a person plant a vineyard? Because they want the fruit from the vine. Okay, why else go to the trouble? Did he plant a good vineyard? Yes, he uh, put a wall around it to protect it. He dug a vat for the wine press. There was a place to put the produce. So was he expecting produce? Totally he was expecting produce. And he built a tower to protect it. Then he hired stewards to come in, vine growers, and rented it to them, meaning they would keep they would live off some of the produce, but would give some of the produce to him. And it says, then he went away on a journey. At the harvest time, he sent a slave to the vine growers in order to receive some of the produce of the vineyard from the vine growers. That seems normal. That's what they agreed on. It says, they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again, he sent another slave. They wounded him in the head. So we see it ramping up. They treated him shamefully. They sent another. And to that one they killed. You can see it progressively getting more emboldened. It says, and they did this with many others, beating some, killing others. He said he had one more to send, a beloved son. And he sent him, last of all of them, saying, they will respect my son. But those vine growers said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him. And the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and they killed him and they threw him out of the vineyard. Jesus says, What will the owner of the vineyard do? He answers, He will come and destroy the vine growers and give the vineyard to others. Now, so let's just stop here for a second and understand that Jesus doesn't explain this parable because as we see in verse 12, they understood clearly what Jesus was saying. Throughout all the Old Testament, there's several passages that describe Israel as a vineyard and God owns the vineyard and that the religious leaders were the ones put in charge. They are the vine growers. And these vine growers were supposed to bring produce to God. But much like Satan, their father, Satan's job was to bring the praise of all the angels to uh, God, wanted to keep that for themselves. And here, same thing. Not Satan, instead of wanting to praise God with the rest of the angels, he wanted it for himself. The vine growers here wanted the vineyard for themselves. They're not the ones who put the vineyard there. They're not the ones who put the vat there. They're not the ones who put the wall there. They're not the ones who uh, built the tower. They just want the produce of it. Uh, we could take that even for Israel or for the whole world. God created this. It's his for his purpose, for his glory. Yet we want it for ourselves. The religious leaders, they loved the temple, not because they loved and wanted to help people get to know God. They wanted what people brought to the temple, which was largely money and influence. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life. Why is money such a big root of all that evil? Because, man, if I've got plenty of money... Whatever my body wants, I can give it. Whatever my eye sees, I can get it. And people are nice to me because they want some of my money too. That's the big problem. Now, Jesus says this, and he quotes again what we read yesterday from Psalm 118. The stone which the builders rejected, this has become the chief corner stone. Who are the builders here? Obviously, it's the religious leaders and Israel. Jesus had come, shown them God's standard in a cornerstone. A cornerstone was the beginning of a building foundation that was perfectly 90 degrees square. 
So then they could build the rest of the building off of that and know that it was square. Jesus came, showed us, this is my beloved son, God the Father said, in whom I am well pleased. This is God's standard. And so Christ came to show us that, yet they didn't want to see it. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to examine themselves. It says, you rejected me, but I'm, I'm the standard. I'm the chief cornerstone. This came from the Lord and is marvelous in our eyes. So you, you get what he's saying. In the parable, the religious leaders are wanting Israel for themselves. They're not wanting to mediate between God and man. They're wanting to be God. Why? Because they're controlled by Satan. Everybody who's controlled by Satan wants to be God. They want control. Now, God sent to them slaves, it says. These are the prophets. And over time in Israel's history, they abused the prophets, abused them. It got worse and worse. Some they killed. Some they just uh, imprisoned and beat to death. Um, but then Jesus sends... I mean, then God the Father sends his son, Jesus. And they didn't respect him. They killed him. And he's prophesying that right here. Um, this quote about the cornerstone, I want you to go with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. I'll go to your right just a little bit. 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, Peter who is listening to this teaching that we're in in Mark, later on, reflecting on it, um, writes this. It says, Therefore, verse 1, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that you may grow in respect to salvation, if you've tasted the grace of the Lord. And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious, where? In the sight of God. You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. Now you and I are mediators. Will we mediate or do we just want to be in control? Will we mediate between God and the lost world or do we just want money from people? It says, we're offering up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. What's that spiritual sacrifice? Our physical lives, our material possessions, all the temporal things that we have to further the eternal. It says, for this is contained in scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then, is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very corner stone. And a stone of tripping, stumbling, and a rock of crushing or offense. Okay, so I either can submit to this, believe, or I can trip over it now and deal with it in belief, or I can disbelieve, and this that same stone will crush me. It says, for they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. And to this doom they were also appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. This is the other that Jesus... Um, Jesus, I'm going to take away the vineyard and give it to another. He's giving it to you and me. We're not the new Israel, but we are the place where people can come and hear about how to be right with God. And it says, so that you may proclaim the excellency of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but you now are the people of God. You have you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, 
so that in the thing in which they slander you as an evildoer, they may because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. God's going to come to them one day. And maybe something from your life God will use to reveal to them truth. Maybe something from my, remember CCR, my conviction, my confession, my repentance, God can use in the life of someone else. They may be degrading me. They may be abusing me now, but I'm going to be abused for the king. It says, verse 12, they were seeking to seize him, yet they feared the people. For they understood that he spoke the parable against them. And so they left him and went away. Um, lots of leaves on the tree, but no fruit. I'm going to ask you again. Are there lots of leaves on your tree, but no fruit? You're a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Meaning you can come to me and find out how you can be right with God, but you never do that goes in and says, Then they sent some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to him in order to trap him in a statement. In the next set of verses, we're going to have Sadducees. So let's talk a minute about that. We've got three contending factions. We've got the Sadducees, we've got the Herodians, and we've got the Pharisees. Now, these are all people who normally were opposed to each other. But they seem to be united against Jesus Christ. Why? Because all of them want power. All three groups want power and control. Yet power and control was given by God the Father to Jesus Christ the servant. So what Jesus has, they want. Now, the Sadducees, they got power from Rome, so they sided with Rome. The Herodians got power from Herod the king, so they were uh, on board with whatever Herod wanted. The Pharisees received power and control from the law, from the Torah, so therefore they held everybody to the account. But it's all, know that it's not that the Sadducees loved Rome, it's not that the Herodians loved Herod, it's not that the Pharisees loved the scriptures is that they received power from these entities, so they had to protect the entity. And when Jesus came along, he threatened all of it because he already has authority. He already has power from the greatest authority that there ever is, and that's his Father. In verse 14, it says, The Pharisees and the Herodians, which normally are against each other, they came and they said to him, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and defer to no one, for you are not partial in any way, but teach the way of God in truth. So they're blowing smoke at him, right? Um, and it says, Is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? So the Herodians would be against this. The Pharisees would be against this. Yet, Rome would be for it, so the, the Sadducees would be for it. So if the Pharisees and the Herodians are kind of agreed they're against this poll tax, so they're trying to trap Jesus. And it says, he, knowing their hypocrisy, knowing they're playing a game here, they're actors, they have got a mask on, but Jesus sees right through the mask. He says to them, why are you testing me? Haven't you noticed that it doesn't do any good to test me? But they're driven on. They hate him. Why do they hate him? He's taking what they love, their money and their power. And guess what? He's calling them out for what they really are. They feel like they love God, but he says you just love money and they can't stand it. He says, bring me a denarius to look at. A Roman coin. And they brought him. He says, whose image and inscription is this? And they said, it's Caesar's. 
And Jesus said to them simply, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, and to God the things that are God. They were trying to trap him into an argument of either having to choose Israel or Rome. But Jesus turns it around on them. And he says, it's not a choice between Israel or Rome. It's a choice between God and money. He says, hey, it's all about whose image is stamped on it, who it belongs to. The money has Caesar's image stamped on it. You, every one of us, according to Genesis 1.27, has God's image stamped on us. So Caesar can have the money, but God wants you. Why? Because he created you. He has a purpose for you. But that purpose has to be according to his will, not according to your and my will. Of course, they weren't happy about this. It says they were amazed at him. What were they amazed? How he could see through their scheme. Yet they scheme on. Verse 18, then the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees did not believe that there was any resurrection. Um, they believed that through uh, keeping up the family line, that immortality could be found. Okay, a much more mystical uh, view of things. So, um, remember... Family line was very important in Israel. It was important because the land was split up to each tribe and to each family. And so the, the inheritance was passed down through the family line. So intermarrying in between uh, tribes would be very difficult because the, the land so would be split into different ways. Also, family line was very important, most important, because... It was going to be a way to verify the identity of Messiah when he comes on the scene. And Jesus fulfilled all of those qualifications. Yet they still rejected him. Interesting thing now, all the Jews that are still at the wailing wall praying for Messiah to come, all after AD 70 when the temple was destroyed, all of the genealogical records were destroyed also. And so therefore, when Antichrist comes and sets himself up as Messiah, there'll be no way to trace whether he is truly qualified or not. But they won't matter. They'll accept it initially. Now, there was this stock story that they had. It was meant to ridicule and make fun of. The Sadducees used this story to anyone who said they believed in life after death. Anybody that believed in resurrection, they had this little story that they would tell. Um, and it goes like this. It's talking in, in verse 19 about leveret marriage. Leveret marriage is that if the oldest son dies, he's married and he dies and he never has any children, never has an heir, that the next brother would take the wife of the older brother and produce children to carry on the family line, to keep the land the way and the inheritance the way it was supposed to. It's called leveret marriage. And so it kind of goes like this, verse 20. There were seven brothers that took a wife. One took a wife and died, leaving no children. The second married her, and it goes all on down to the last of all the women. The, all of them died. They were the, the This one woman was married to all seven brothers, and they never had any children. The question that in the resurrection, when they rise again, which one will she, which uh, one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. Now it's interesting, uh, some of the problems here. They really see a wife not as a, a person that God would love, which he does, and they are. They saw her as more like property, which she is not, and God never meant to be. Um, Jesus said to them, is this not the reason you are mistaken? He said, you're, you're wrong. Uh, your little story, I don't care how many times you say it, it's 
mistaken. And here's why. You've got two problems. You can kind of understand why they hate him so much. You've got two problems. You don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. Those are kind of two big things when you're a religious leader and part of the Sanhedrin. You go all the way in town and everybody looks up to you because you, you know the scriptures and because uh, you supposedly know the power of God, but they knew neither. And Jesus goes on, he says, For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry or are given in marriage. Now, wait a minute. Know that what he says here is, the fact is that when you or I die, there is life after death. Everyone will live after physical death. Okay, so he just kind of screams on by that. It's not through family, it's through resurrection. He goes on, he says, uh, when they rise from the dead, when, uh, they are not going to be married or given in marriage, but are going to be like the angels in heaven. Okay, period. Uh, when you get to heaven, my wife is not going to be my wife. I'm going to be part of the bride of Christ. It's going to be different. A couple, well, three. Let's talk about three wrong assumptions here about resurrection. First, they believe that life eternally would be like life now. And clearly, Jesus is saying it's not identical. Second, people are not going to be married in heaven, except to Jesus. Now, also, immortality is found in, uh, it's not found by carrying on a family line, but it's found in resurrection. And we know later on that this resurrection is in Jesus Christ. So, verse 26 says, but regarding the fact that the dead rise again. Okay, so the fact. Okay, when Jesus is saying, now regarding the fact, something that they said was a lie. So Jesus is saying it's a fact. You have not read, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. Now here's the thing. This was hundreds of years after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had already died. So, if God's saying they're dead and they're gone, then God would have said, I was the God of Abraham. I was the God of Isaac. I was the God of Jacob. But that's not what God said. He said, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of uh, Isaac. And I am the God of Jacob. Uh, so, he says, verse 27... God is not the God of the dead, is he? No, but he's the God of the living. And he says, by the way, you're just dead wrong. Now, that had to have made the Sadducees very upset. And they're the ones who largely control the Sanhedrin, which will be the ones voting to put him to death. However, this kind of tickled the Pharisees a little bit because they did believe in the resurrection. So it was almost as if Jesus was siding with the Pharisees. One of the scribes came and he heard them arguing and recognizing that Jesus had answered them well, asked him, What then is the greatest, the foremost of all the commandments? And Jesus described the Shema from Deuteronomy 6. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and the outcome will be that you love your neighbor as yourself. Remember, the you can work backwards on this and see how to get to know God. How do I love God? It starts between my ears. I have to renew my mind with what God's Word says, not my own understanding. I draw strength from what God's Word says. I make choices, my soul, based on what God's Word says, not what I think. And then... My heart is the priorities that will come from that. So if you think about the mind being the input to the will or the soul, that I make choices. So I, I think things, then I make choices. And these choices produce an output, an outcome, or the priorities of my life. How do I get to know God? Through this process. What will be the outcome? 
what will be the heart of it? I will have a heart for God and a heart for other people. If I love my neighbor like I love myself and I love God, I've surrendered my life to God, then I'm going to want nothing more than to share Christ with other people so that they can get right with God. And the scribe agrees with Jesus, says, hey, that's right on. That's exactly what I believe, he says. And he says, this is an interesting point, which is different than most of the religious leaders that Jesus has sparred with. Look what he says. He says, um, at the end of verse 32, I mean 33, he says, it's much more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. You can do all this stuff at the temple, okay? And, and here's getting back to the fig tree. This, this scribe is saying, we've got all these leaves at the temple. We've got the burnt offerings and the sacrifices. But it doesn't matter two hoots if the fruit of loving God and loving your neighbor isn't produced in there. So we have all these entrapments to say we love God, but if the fruit of loving our neighbor never comes out of this, then it's all a sham. And Jesus perks up. He says, hey, this is different than anybody else I've talked to. And I'm thinking maybe this is Joseph of Arimathea, or maybe this is Nicodemus. Somebody who we see later on comes to faith in Jesus Christ. Look what he says. He says, when Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, you are not far away from the kingdom of God. Now, the rich young ruler that we had in chapter 10, verse 17, he was close also, but he walked away. But this, this particular scribe is understanding. He's not trying to manipulate Jesus like all of the rest of the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians. There's something different going on here, and Jesus knows it, and he tells him, I love this about Jesus. He doesn't hate them. He doesn't hate the scribes or the Pharisees or the Sadducees. He's trying to show them truth in hopes that they would surrender control of their lives. Now, we get into this, and Jesus began to say, uh, he, he taught in the temple. How is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? Now, this scribe that he's just talked to, he says, you're close. So he says, let's ask you another question. You scribes teach that, that Messiah is the son of David. And if that's true, how come David says um, in Psalm 110, how come is that David says, the Lord said to my Lord, just take that phrase, those two lords are not the same Hebrew word. It would be kind of like this. Yahweh said to my Adonai. Okay, Yahweh is the covenant name for God that they were never to speak because they didn't want to speak God's name in vain and break um, the third commandment. So here, Yahweh is used. The second word, Lord, is Adonai, which means master or Lord. So, um, the first one is Yahweh, the covenant name for God. They used Lord because um, they didn't want to use in a wrong way the covenant name of God. They would use the they would use the letters for Yahweh and use the cons the vowels for Adonai, which would make up a, a, a word that wasn't really a word called Yehovah or Jehovah, what we say. Jehovah is not a Hebrew word. It's a made-up word. Using the word Yahweh and the vowels from Adonai mixed together so that they would not use God's name in vain. So he's saying here, he's asking the scribes, you say that Jesus is going to be the descendant of David, which would mean David would be on a higher level than his descendants. So if that's true, how come... In this passage in Psalm 110 that is definitely, they would say, speaking about Messiah, how come it says that David is calling Messiah Lord? He's saying Messiah is higher than him. What Jesus is getting at is the misunderstanding that the scribes had that Jesus would be 100% man, a descendant 
of David, but he also would be 100% God, David's Lord, both together. And what Jesus is helping, this scribe has seen some light and is processing it. And what do we see? Jesus giving him more light. David himself calls him Lord. So in what sense is he David's son? And then it never answers that. But it says the large crowd enjoyed listening to him. Now, eternal life is only found in Jesus Christ being your Lord, which means what Jesus was teaching had to be personally applied. And when it's personally applied initially, sometimes we respond with anger. But it has to be personally applied. Just coming and hearing Jesus and going, wow, that's a beautiful talk that he gave today. Was of no eternal value. We move into this last section where Jesus it says, in his teaching, he was saying, beware of the scribes. Who, so, so get it. He just got talking to a scribe and he, then he, he, do you believe, that the scribe believe that he's 100% God and 100% man and clearly they did not. So he's confronting them with that. And this is, hey, you like to walk around in these long robes. You love respectful greetings, chief seats, places of honor. But yet, what? It says, you say you love God and you people should respect you because you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your uh, heart. But yet, you don't love your neighbor. They would describe, it says, it says here, you who devour widows' houses. The religious leaders believe that if your husband died, you were cursed. You were cursed. You're a wicked, nasty sinner. You're about the same as the prostitute. You're about the same as the tax collector. You're about the same as the person who can't see or hear or has leprosy. So if we can manipulate you and take your property, we're going to do it. They didn't care anything about the widows. Matter of fact, they thought it was loving for them to abuse them because they're wicked sinners. And they're right. The widow was a, a wicked sinner. However, their wrong assumption was that they were not wicked sinners. And he goes on. He says, and for appearance sake, offer long prayers. They have all the leaves, but no fruit. They have all the leaves of the fig tree of loving God, yet no fruit. I'm going to ask you again. You say you're a Christian. You say you've surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. You say you have all the leaves. Where's the fruit? Where's the fruit of you loving your neighbor enough to share the gospel with someone else? He goes in. Verse 41, he sat down opposite the treasury. And here's what we know. False religion is always about pride. You know, how everybody sees me. I didn't dress up today for that reason another reason um it's always prideful and it's always really about the love of money what do we find jesus comes in and he's just watching people there were these big shofars or metal horns that they would have to put money into and people would go take their money and and break it into small denominations of coins so that they could drop them in and make lots of noise so that everybody, when they were putting all this money, and they would put it in one at a time so that people would all look over when they were putting their money in and know how much they loved God and how much they were giving. That was what was going on. And Jesus is watching this like he was in our last chapter doing a divine inspection. He's doing a divine inspection of the giving. And it says, hey, um, there were rich people giving and there was this poor widow giving. Um, she just gave two copper coins, which are th so thin that when she dropped them in, they wouldn't make any noise at all. And so nobody would look at her. Nobody cared, but she's trash, right? Yet 
she gave everything that she had. And here it says, truly I say she gave more contribution than all of them because uh, they gave out of their surplus. She gave everything that she had to live on. But that's not even really the point. If you go away from this text saying, hey, you should give, uh, not from your surplus, but you should, you should give. But that, he's not saying widows should go out and give everything that they have. He's saying if you're a Christian, you've already given everything that you have. Okay? But here he's saying we're talking about loving God. by. I know I love God by the way I love my neighbor. And they were willing to let this woman come in to the fig tree that had all the leaves on it. They were willing to even take her last two pieces of money. Yet they were never had the ability to help her get to know God. They're using her. This is the representation of them devouring the widow's house or household. They don't care about her. They love money. And they'll even take the last bit that she has. They don't care. They don't have the wherewithal to help her. Why? They're no help because they don't know God themselves. And they don't know God themselves. They can't help others get to know God. So the point in this is, if you love God, you're going to, of necessity, love your neighbor there's the great commandment and the great commission. It's been said that the great commandment plus the great commission is going to make a great church. And I agree totally. If you and I love the Lord my God, if you love the Lord your God with all of your priorities, with all of your choices, with all of your thinking, then what's going to be the result of that is you're going to deny yourself. You're going to serve others, even the people that can't further you. The problem is, is that the love defined for my neighbor is the Great Commission. What does the Great Commission say? Go make Disciples. That's the command. That's the commission. How do I do that? First, by baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Helping them to be introduced to Jesus Christ so that they can unconditionally surrender. Then, teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded. Two ways to make disciples. Both and. The question is, first, do you love God? And if you say you do love God, do you love your neighbor? And if you say you love your neighbor, are you sharing the gospel with your neighbor? Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for um, your spirit. May those two entities come together today in our lives. Father, may you use us today. May your words be in our mouths for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.